Before I do weddings and I marry people, I always talk to them and have counseling with them to determine if any of them are bringing any baggage into the wedding. If there are issues or items we need to work on, we'll resolve those before we actually get into the wedding ceremony. And I have had some in the case where, in, in the past, where, you know, you could do a counseling session one night, and sometimes it's been three months for others. But the, the key is that the baggage is there, you just need to work on it. You need to work on it. So what kind of baggage can people bring into a marriage? Sometimes you may have an anger problem. I'll do better in 2011, I promise, than what happens. You grab a whole little baggage and carry it with you. Sometimes it's abuse. Sometimes it's abuse of drugs or alcohol. There are many things that people carry from one year into the next. Some of them might be broken relationships with your spouse, with your family. But you refuse to leave this in one year because you definitely want to carry it with you. Because sometimes we like to have things to complain about. Oh, if I didn't have this baggage, man, I'd be something different. But you know, I can't turn that baggage loose. I've got to keep it with me. But I'm telling you that the baggage that you carry in your life, and yours may be individual to any of the ones that I've mentioned already, and you probably know what those are. God is saying, leave it. Leave it. 
Leave the baggage. I can set you free of that. I can set you free of that baggage once and for all. Sometimes it takes God's help. Because we like to hang on to stuff. And we're going to learn this morning of a man. He just couldn't turn loose his baggage. And because of that, he never became the man of God that, he wanted, that God wanted him to be. Open your Bibles this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to learn about a man named Saul this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 10, we're going to read verse 1 in just a minute. Like I always like doing, I like to give you the history of what's going on during the story. To find 1 Samuel chapter 10, in with verse 1. And as I talk about the baggage this morning, wouldn't you like to leave the baggage here today? That's a real question. Wouldn't you like to leave it here once and for all? Now let me tell you, if you're there at 1 Samuel chapter 10, we'll read verse 1. And then I'll give you the history of what's going on. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? Now let me stop there just for a minute. Let me tell you where the children of Israel are. <coughs> Up to this point, God had led the people. He had led the children of Israel through a number of different ways. Through the prophets. If the people want to know what God wanted them to do, they would go to the prophet, he would go to God and get the prayer, and then he would come back to the people and say, God has told us to move forward. We can go into the new land. That's the way they found out. That's the way they ruled. God gave them laws. He gave them rules for the society. And then they were also ruled by judges. These were godly men also, oftentimes prophets. Samuel was a prophet, and he was also a judge. So if there was any, any bickering between the people, they would come to him, and he would make a ruling. After he sought God's guidance and wisdom. Samuel was now getting very old. And he had two sons, and the Bible says they did not walk in the way of their father. For they were evil men. They took bribes. They just weren't the man of God that Samuel was. And so the people came together in unison and they said, we don't want to be ruled by judges anymore. We want a king to rule over us so that we will be like other nations. Now, I want you to think about the fallacy of that. First of all, the children of God have been separate people. God has selected them as his chosen people. Now, what are the chosen people saying? We want to be like everybody else. So Samuel, being very distressed, went before God and he said, God, the people are asking for a king. Now, Samuel took this very personal because he thought they were rejecting him. God said, no, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting who? rejecting God. So go back and tell the people if they want a king, I will certainly let them have it. <coughs> However, he will take the best of your crops. He will take a tenth of everything that you grow and that you earn over the years. The king will take your children and have them serve as servants in his, in his kingdom. He will put them in the army. <coughs> You will be under his rule. And there will come a time, Samuel, make sure you tell them this, that they will say, we've had enough of a king and we don't want one anymore. And God said, I will not listen to them. So you go back to them, Samuel, and give them a choice. God gives us free choice, doesn't he? He gives us free choice to make decisions. And oftentimes we will make the wrong decision. But God gives us that choice. And so Samuel went back to the people and said, gather around. Here's what God said. And he told them all that. And the people said, we don't care. We want a king. 
king. And so God said, so be it. So in the countryside, there was a young man. His name was Saul. He was a Benjamite. Now, there were how many tribes of Israel? Twelve. Benjamin was one of the, one of the tribes. He was a Benjamite. The Benjamites were looked down upon. They were the smallest and the rowdiest. And if you had to gauge them on evilness, Benjamins, the Benjamites were evil. And I'll tell you why. There was a murder and a rape in one of the other tribes, and the Benjamites refused to give up the guilty people to the other tribes. And so based on that, the other tribes came together and they actually went to war with the Benjamites. So they were looked down upon. And so Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. God said, I will lead you, Samuel, to, to your king. So Saul is in his home one day with his father, and his father said, Saul, we've lost our donkeys. We have no idea where they are. Take a servant and go out and find your donkeys. So Saul gets a servant, rises up early in the morning, he goes, and he can't find them either. So his servant said, let's go into the town. There's a prophet in there. His name is Samuel. We'll ask him where the donkeys are. Now what Saul didn't realize is that God was leading Saul to who? To Samuel. And so Saul walks in and he says, Samuel, I've lost the father's donkeys. Do you know who they are? And Saul says, yes, don't worry about it. They've been found. Samuel said, don't worry about it. They've been found. You stay here and you eat with me tonight. And then tomorrow rise up and I have something very special for you. That's where we are with our story. 1 Samuel chapter 10, let's look at verse 9. See how Saul reacted. 1 Samuel 10, verse 9. See how Saul reacted to Samuel. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gibberth, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? The man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, Is Saul among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. The high place is where they worshipped. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for donkeys, he said. But when, he, but when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me what Samuel said to you. Now this is the verse I want you to, to key in on this morning. So the uncle says, tell me what Samuel has told you. What did we read in chapter 10, verse 1? What had already happened? He was anointed king over all the land by Samuel. So Saul already knows now that he is to be king. And look what he tells his uncle. And Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys have been found but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. You know what? Saul just couldn't turn that baggage loose, could he? I am from the tribe of Benjamin. We are the least of the tribes. Saul did not tell him that he had been anointed king. <coughs> Look what happens now. Verse 17 Samuel summoned all the people of Israel to the Lord and Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have brought Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms who oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God who saves you out of your calamities and distresses. And you have said, No, set a king over us. So now present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and clans. And when Samuel brought all the tribes together, the tribe of Benjamin 